we uh, bought a backup disk to back up all of our files just in case it's my fault again that they get deleted, which it is. My computer had a virus, and it's a virus that deletes files. And I'm going, who writes these things anyway? Yeah. But anyway, um, I started backing up all the files, which is all the PowerPoints, all the Word documents, the books, and all the sermons, I think that go all the way back to maybe 2011, maybe before then, and um, it's six and a half terabytes. A byte is roughly like one character on the screen, so a kilobyte is a, a, a thousand bytes, a megabyte is a million bytes, a gigabyte is a billion, and a terabyte is a, would be a trillion, right? Yeah. yeah, million, billion, trillion, so we have six and a half trillion characters, or just one big character, that'd be me. That's pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. First, Second Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians 11. <clears throat> things that are false. This is things that are false week or month or year. Second uh, Corinthians 11, verse 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may, they may be found even as we. So he's speaking of occasion, which means they want everybody's attention. Verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into a Lucifer. That's what that means. The phrase Lucifer, which Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The word Lucifer. Lusa means lucent. That's where we get the word lucent from. Or lucid. If you ever had a lucid dream, that means it's a memorable dream. You remember every aspect of it. Lucis means light, and the phrase Lucifer means light bearer, or if you look in verse 14, a messenger or an angel of light, and the two mean the same thing. So, Lucifer was his name, we assume given by God, he is the light bearer, and that's what you see in verse 14. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So we're looking at things that are false. We have false apostles. And um, I've been meaning to throw in here and I'll have to uh, go back on my notes or I'll just have to do the study all over again, uh, the idea that anybody calling themselves an apostle now, that is a false apostle. Um, the office of apostle is, it's a biblically recognized office. It's an office given by Christ himself. Christ is the chief apostle. So nobody can take his place. Nobody, he did not leave his office vacant. And the apostles were, according to scriptures, they were appointed by Christ personally. So that's why in Acts chapter 1, when Judas, uh, who betrayed Christ and then hung himself, that office was vacant. So there must have been someone else appointed in his place. And uh, Peter gave the rules for, or the qualifications for the office of apostle. And they had to be a, someone who was 
personally picked or personally aware of Christ. And, uh, of course, they chose Matthias. The lot, they cast lots upon two candidates, and the lot fell upon Matthias. And so uh, the apostle Paul, being an apostle, was personally chosen by Christ on his road to Damascus. And so there are those who say that there are apostles on throughout history. Um, there are a group of Pentecostals who believe that the office of apostle still exists. And so uh, there are several men and probably a few women who call themselves apostles uh, even today which means that they can come up with doctrine. They can write doctrine for people to believe in. So anybody who would call themselves an apostle now, they believe that what they say is, holds the same weight as the Bible in the Catholic Church. The, the office of the Pope is based upon the idea of what they call apostolic succession, which means that from Peter... Uh, Peter was the first pope, according to them, and that after Peter died, then there was a line of popes that exist all the way back to the days of Peter, and uh, which means that those men who they believe they themselves are apostles, that they, when they speak, that that holds the same weight as the Bible, or actually, in the Catholic Church's case, the, when the Pope speaks, it holds more weight than the Bible. In other words, we're to believe the Pope first, the Bible second. So, I do not agree and do not believe in apostolic succession. I do not believe that the office of apostle um, is still an office where people can fulfill that role. I think Christ chose the twelve, then he chose the apostle Paul, and that's it. Because the foundation of the church, the Bible says, is built upon the foundation of the apostles, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So if the foundation has already been laid, that which foundation is the New Testament, then obviously there can be no more apostles because then you'd just be building a bigger foundation and the idea is that these guys can speak and what they say holds the same weight or more weight than the scriptures. And I do not agree with that. I think Paul being the last chosen apostle after he died, John being the last one living, he lived all the way into the 90s um, of A.D., right before he died, right before A.D. 100. And um, no more apostles after that. So we have the writings of the apostles in the New Testament but there are no, nobody has filled that office since those men passed away. So anybody calling themselves apostle now either doesn't understand the term, which in Kenya, there are some pastors that we know that um, see themselves as sort of church overseers, and I can kind of understand that, but they refer to themselves as apostles, and I do not agree with that. Uh, so anyway, moving on from there, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. So anything false in the Bible, to me, they're all going to be part of the same barrel. And we've been dealing with things that are false. Now we're going to deal with false Bibles. Matthew 26, 20. Um, let's go there and let's get the context of it. Matthew 26 is toward the end of the book of Matthew. There's 28 chapters in Matthew. So Matthew 26 would be right around the time of his crucifixion. And uh, in verse 60, we'll back up a little bit. Let's go to verse 57 in Matthew 26. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. The elders were, in the days of Moses, um, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, told him, Moses, you're sitting in the judgment seat, and that's not good, because every little trifling quarrel that everybody has with one another, 
you're sitting in a judgment seat and you're the only judge over the 12 tribes and you're sitting there all day and the smallest little quarrel between people, you're having to judge, you know, who's right and who's wrong in those cases. And he said, it's not good that you should do that. You're sitting all day in judgment seat, not getting, no, doing nothing else. And so upon Jethro's request, he said, Moses, why don't you select men to help you judge? So he chose 70 men. And that is what, the, what we now call the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> but it was 70 elders of the tribes of Israel that were selected to help judge over the tribes. And so that, seven, that group of 70 was still in existence in Christ's day. But as with anything, over time, that office and that responsibility became, it became very corrupt. And Jesus in uh, Matthew 23, if you look back there very quickly, he berates the scribes and Pharisees in verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So there it is. You have the, the 70 elders. Uh, and Jesus said, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So he said, as far as authority goes, God appointed these men to be in authority over you, and as far as judging matters of the law, do what they say. But do not do after their works, because Jesus knew that their office had become very, very corrupt. And what they did, they did what is common with elected officials and judges and anybody in authority. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's the wicked, depraved nature of man that anybody in authority, after a while, that authority is going to corrupt them. And which I believe in term limits. I wish we had term limits for members of Congress and sitting judges, because the longer they're in, the more corrupt they become. And um, so anyway, th that's the office of the Sanhedrin, or the elders of the judges of Israel. They had, they had, these men had become very corrupt, and what they had done was they had, they had set up a set of loopholes that they themselves did not have to obey certain parts of the law, or anybody, any of their cronies, we what we would call them, any of their people that they favored, either by way of money or influence or whatever, they built in loopholes to the law, ways that you didn't have to obey the law if you didn't want to, but you still considered yourself to be righteous. So Jesus said, as far as them judging over the law, do what they say. But as far as their works and how they live, don't follow after them. They're very corrupt. And he says later on that, they will compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when they do, they've made them twofold more the child of hell than, than they were at the beginning. And what that sh a twofold child of hell means that they're twice dead. And it means that they are not going to be saved. They have already been so corrupted that they are twice dead. They're twofold the child of hell and they're going to hell and that's all there is to it. There's no, there's no redemption for them. So anyway... Um, in Matthew 26, that's who now he is standing in front of. He's standing in front of Caiaphas, the high priest, who himself hated Jesus and would not recognize him for who he was and his influence over the elders. Now, we know one of those elders, one of those members of the Sanhedrin was a man by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus in John 3 is the one who we find Jesus with at night. And Jesus tells him, you know, you must be born again. And Nicodemus asking him the question, how can I be born again? And then, of course, Jesus gives him John chapter 3, verse 16. And we believe that Nicodemus was a believer. And I believe it was Nicodemus that donated his uh, burial chamber, his burial cave for Jesus uh, to be buried in. So, we have the elders of Israel in verse 57. 
Caiaphas, the high priest, and the scribes and the elders in verse 58. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Why? Because there was a law that said at the mouth of one witness, you're not to condemn anybody. But out of the mouth of two witnesses or three, uh, that's how they can condemn someone. So they were looking for two witnesses who could testify that Jesus had in fact blasphemed and was worthy of death. But notice in verse uh, 60, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. And at the last came two false witnesses. So in verse 61, and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And, but we know in, according to Mark 14, I have that up on the screen. You can turn there, you can look there for many bear false witness against them, but their witness agreed not together. So we have, we have in Matthew 26, part of the story, Mark 14, another part of the story. It's the same story. So they found two false witnesses, but their witnesses didn't even agree with each other. But they went ahead and crucified him anyway. Okay? Now, to me, that's significant. And here's why I'm saying this. Up on the screen are two false witnesses. One is the Greek manuscript of the New Testament known as Vaticanus. The other one is a Greek manuscript of the New Testament known as Sinaiticus. It's found at a monastery at Mount, which they call it Mount Sinai, in what's called the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, but that's not even where Mount Sinai is. Paul gives testimony that the real Mount Sinai is not in Egypt. It's in Saudi Arabia. He says that in Galatians chapter 5. But this Mount uh, Sinai, which is in Arabia, and there is a place in Arabia called Jabal al-Laws, and it's the, uh, the Saudi government has partitioned this area off, and they will not let anybody into it now. But a few years ago, it was open area, and there's been several teams of archaeologists go to the same site and they both testify or they all testify that Jabal El Laws is the real Mount Sinai. There's an area on top of this mountain that to this day it's charred black because God came down in fire and burnt the top of this mountain and to this day the rocks are charred black on the top of this mountain. And there's other evidence that this is the area where the camp of the Israelites were. But it's in Arabia where Paul said it was, not the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church designated the Sinai, Sinai Peninsula as where Mount Sinai is. And they built, uh, of course, they put their church there. Any place that they say is of biblical significance, they put a Catholic church there or a monastery. So there's a monastery there at the base of the fake Mount Sinai and there was a Greek manuscript where parts of it had been thrown into a trash bin at this monastery. The monks were going to burn it. They were going to use this old paper to start fires with. And a man by the name of Tischendorf in the 1800s discovered some of these scrolls in the trash bin. And he claims that it's a Greek copy of the New Testament that goes back to 300 A.D., it's the same with the Vaticanus document. So when scholars compare the Greek New Testament called the Vaticanus with the Greek New Testament called Sinaiticus, when they compare them, they find that these two documents don't even agree with each other as to what the New Testament says in Greek. And they claim that these are the best manuscripts that we have ever found 
because they go back all the way to 300 AD and the claim is that these are the best manuscripts. But these two manuscripts don't even agree with each other as far as the reading of the New Testament. So how can these two Greek New Testaments be the best source of understanding what the New Testament really says when they don't agree? If you were to bring two witnesses into court and they were witnesses, let's say that Jeremy was accused of murdering his two twin daughters or attempting to. And in his defense, they brought in two witnesses and these two witnesses, their testimony didn't agree with each other. The jury would say, those are the worst witnesses in the world because then the prosecutor just tore them to pieces and they're going, Jeremy, if that's the best you've got, you're in bad shape, bud. Okay, you're sunk. In any court, if two witnesses are brought in and they testify and they don't even agree with each other, they can't get their story straight. Cubby, why do cops, when they pull up a car full of people and they suspect something, why do cops pull the people out of the cars and start interviewing them away from each other? To make sure they're telling the truth. Because if they don't all have the same story, you're going you're gonna to say, where are you guys going? Oh, we're heading into Potosi. And then they ask the other guy, where are you guys going? Oh, we're going to Fredericktown. Wait a minute, your stories, you, you need to get your story straight. If the witnesses don't agree, and on most parts, you can't trust anything they say. Right? So here we have. Uh, the the uh, Anglican scholars, Westcott and Hort, in the 1800s, they were assigned the duty of re rewriting the King James Bible or the King's Bible. Their job was to simply update the language. They didn't do that. They didn't just update the language of the King's Bible. They went... And since they didn't like the Textus Receptus, which is where the King James comes from, they didn't like it. They said that the Vatican's, the Vatican's document and the Mount Sinai document were the best documents. And so they completely revised the New Testament. And that's where the revised version comes in. And it is so different from the King James that the king said, well, this is not really what I asked for. So he couldn't call it a, like a modernization of the king's language from the 1611 Bible. So they had to call it, they called it the revised standard version because it wasn't anything like the King James Bible because he based it upon the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. Well, when Westcott and Hort did that, others followed. And so now, amongst seminaries, Bible colleges, any kind of Bible scholar area anywhere in the world, these guys have jumped over to believing that the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus are in fact the best Greek New Testaments that we have. And so all of the modern Bibles, every one of them is based upon the Greek reading from Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and not from the received text, which was the King, what the King James was based on. So if you're reading an NIV or a New American Standard or the Holman Standard Bible or whatever modern translation you're reading and you find that they don't say the same things as the King James does, there's a reason why. It's because they decided to go with the two false witnesses whose testimony agreed not with each other. They decided to go with those two and abandoned the received text that the King James was from. So it's not just how they translated it that makes the new Bibles different. It's what they translated from that makes these Bibles different. 
The devil, the devil is a, an immortal being, meaning that he's been around since the Garden of Eden. He was there all through the Old Testament. He was there all through the New Testament. And he's been setting up his plan now for a long time. Uh, it's like planting a seed and you know that the seed is not going to pop right up out of the ground and produce fruit while you're standing there looking at it. It doesn't do magic. It takes time. If you're going to plant an apple tree, you plant the seedling, but you know you've got years before you're going to see any significant fruit from that tree. Well, the devil planted seeds 2,000 years ago. And as Paul said, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Paul knew what was going on even in his day. Even as the guys are writing the New Testament, there are wicked people who are getting those letters that the apostles wrote, not liking what they said. So when they made their copies, they just left stuff out. Like 1 John 5, 7, like Acts 8, 37. They either left things out or they altered the text. So then the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, they come from the corrupted Greek manuscripts rather than the pure manuscripts. Okay, so just there's, there's, a, there's a truth and then there's every lie in the world. The Bible is the truth. Well, these new Bibles came from a corrupted tree and a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit that's just that's the honesty of how it is you cannot build your life upon lies okay you can try it it will all come crumbling down one of these days okay it just doesn't work the idea of why when you build a house or you build a building whether you're going to use wood or concrete or you're going to use iron when you set the foundation, that foundation has to be true. When you put those beams up, those beams have to be perfectly vertical. Any building that's leaning a little bit at the bottom is leaning a lot at the top. And as time goes on, that building's going to topple. No matter, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It's just going to do that. So anyway, here's, here's the difference between them. Uh, look up on the screen. On the left is the King James. On the right is the NIV. And I want you to notice how they're different. Hosea 11, verse 12. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God, and is faithful with the saints. That's the King James. The NIV, this same verse says, Judah is unruly against God, even against the faithful and holy one. Now, those two are not saying the same thing. One says that Judah is faithful and ruleth with God. The other says Judah is unruly against God and against the faithful and holy one. So they're, they're opposite words. Which one's true? So you'll have pastor after pastor and scholar after scholar tell you, well, the best way to understand what God said is to lay three or four, five, six, seven, eight different translations in front of you. There are even parallel Bibles that are printed that have four different translations on each page. They'll have a King James, a NIV, a New American Standard, and whatever. Um, the, I've told everybody, I can now say this 30 some odd years after Bible college, when I took Greek class, I cheated. You're supposed to buy a Greek New Testament. Well, I got a Greek interlinear New Testament which means it has the Greek and right underneath it, it has the translation of all the words. So I cheated, but that Greek interlinear Bible was, it had the New American Standard on one and it had the Greek on the other. And I could see that the New American Standard didn't even agree with the Greek I was looking at. So I don't know where they got it. But anyway, they'll tell you that you can look at all the different translations and then... I. The doctor we took our kids to. He was a Baptist here in this town. And I don't remember how I brought it up one time, but he said, I like to look at all the translations to see, you know, what they all say. I kind of get a clear idea of what God's saying. But if they're saying two different things, 
then how can you know which one is the truth and which one isn't? Okay? So, either Judah rules with God and is faithful, or Judah is unruly against God and is not faithful. So which, and Judah is the house that Jesus came from. So if Judah is unruly against God, what does that say about Christ who came from the line of Judah? See, they testify, they are false witnesses testifying against Christ. Okay? Genesis 22, 2. This is Abraham. And he said, this is God speaking to Abraham. Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. Let me make that bigger so you can see it. Whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So in the King James, God tells Abraham to offer Isaac. The NIV has it where God says, sacrifice him there. What's the difference? Offer him versus sacrifice him there. And here's the difference. When Abraham took Isaac and laid him on the altar, at that point, he had fulfilled what God said. He offered him. God did not tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. If he had, when this angel shows up and says, lay not thy hand upon thy son, Abraham should have looked at the angel and said, God told me to sacrifice him, and that's what I'm going to do. But that's not what God told him. God told him to offer him, and that's what he did. He fulfilled what God said. Therefore, God called him righteous, okay? Because he believed God. God accounted it to him for righteousness. So, did he offer him? Did God tell him to offer him? Or did God tell him to sacrifice him? If we believe that God told him to sacrifice. And then even if God shows up himself and says, do not lay your hand to him. Then God has changed his word. And God never changes. He said, the word that proceeds out of my mouth does exactly what I sent it forth to do. So that means that God then changed his mind or changed, altered the word that came out of his mouth. And the Bible tells us that God never does that. And that's, and I, I picked up on that one time because years ago we took our kids down with a group of churches to a youth function. And the guy that was given the, the, uh, the Bible study to the kids he was reading out of NIV and he used that verse and I went, that is not what God said. It ca I caught it. I'm going, that's not what God said. God did not tell him to sacrifice him, told him to offer him. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the King James. The West Cotton Hort Bible, the Revised Standard Bible says a young woman will conceive. What's the difference? Was she a virgin or was she just a young woman? Was she just a maiden? Okay. Does it make a difference? Can Christ have been born from a woman who had already given birth? No. Why? Because Christ was the first born. He had to be because that's what was written in the law. That the first born... The, who at whatever child opened the matrix, which is the womb of man or beast, that belongs to the Lord. So had Mary given conception after, um, how can I say this? After she had given birth to somebody else, it would not have fulfilled scripture. So it makes a difference. Micah chapter five, verse two. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Teaching us that Christ, even though he was born in Bethlehem, he already was from everlasting. Christ was not invented on the first day of creation. He did not just show up that day. He always has been. 
Yet the NIV says whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Origins, meaning that Christ had a beginning. But we know that he didn't because he is, he was equal with God. He is eternal with God. There is false doctrine. And there are churches that believe that Christ um, was created or that Christ uh, was not even a, around before the creation, that he wasn't eternal with God. But Jesus, in John 17, when he's praying that prayer to God in John 17, he, Jesus himself talks about uh, sharing the glory with God that they had before the world was. So Jesus himself declared in his prayer that he was with God before the creation. The NIV tells you that Jesus had an origin and he was from ancient times, but not from everlasting. And there's a difference. And by the way, Micah 5 is where Herod said to the scribes and the Pharisees, he said to the scribes, where is he that is to be born king of the Jews? And it's from Micah that they found out where he was going to be born. He was being born in Bethlehem. So Christ fulfills the prophecy of Micah chapter 5, but only from the King James, not from these new Bibles. Matthew 18, 3. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Be converted. That means that it's an outward act upon you. Someone converted you. Someone brought you and transformed you. And that someone was the Holy Spirit or God. God is the one who changed you. The NIV says, he said, I tell you the truth unless you change and become like little children. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Who in here has tried to change themselves? Did it work? It won't. Jeremy was giving me testimony this morning when I walked in about how God has blessed him as far as his health is concerned. Could you have done that on your own? You can't alter your body yourself. You can't think and be healthy. It doesn't work. God has to do it. God has to convert you, except ye be converted. There is the difference. And there's many cases in the NIV and these modern Bibles that sort of let the church people think that the responsibility is on them rather than on God. That it's more of your works that make the difference with God rather than what God does himself. There's many examples of that. John 3, 16. We all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The New English Version, the Revised Standard Version, the NIV, the New American Standard, the Holman Christian Standard, and the list goes on. Every modern Bible calls him his only son or his one and only son. Why is that not true? Why is that not true? We're sons and daughters. We are sons of God. Jesus is not the only son of God. He's the only begotten son. And the King James is stands alone in proclaiming that every other modern Bible refers to him as his one and only son. Beth Moore did a tour. She's a Southern Baptist and she speaks a lot of Southern Baptist churches, which she ought not because she's usurping authority. And she speaks all of And her tour a couple years ago was called the one and only Jesus, the one and only. And she even wrote a book about that, Jesus the one and only. And where she got that from was from the NIV, where Jesus is, I'm not done. Hang on. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The New English Version says every inspired scripture has its use. What's the difference? 
Yeah. That means some of the Bible is inspired. And the ones that are inspired has its use. Whereas the King James says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. What's the difference? That's the difference. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And every modern Bible says he appeared in a body. Who? It does not indicate who. And this is important because John told us how to recognize the spirit of Antichrist. He said the spirit of Antichrist will not recognize that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And right here, it tells you, it does not indicate who appeared in a body. It just says he. So that goes to a corruption in the Greek text. Whereas you would have the word theos in Greek, which is God. You don't have that word theos. You just have a masculine verb, he appeared in a body. And it's removed God out of that verse. 2 Corinthians 2.17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But the NIV says, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Well, that's not true either. That's why they made these new Bibles. They're money makers. Mark 10, 24, his disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? The NIV takes part of that out and says, How hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. No, it's not. I was nine. How old were you, Megan? Five. How hard was it? Unless you come to me as little children. And children can know and believe. Amen? It's not that hard. So they took out for them that trust in riches. And the list goes on. And I'm not even, I was going to try to finish this, but I've got like 20 more verses here. The list goes on and on and on and on. You have the true witness, and then you have two false witnesses, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. They don't agree with each other as to what the New Testament should say. And now they definitely don't agree with the King James and with the line of Greek manuscripts that the King James came from. They're two separate lines of manuscripts. Two different foundations, if that makes better sense. Two different foundations. One foundation is not true because the lines don't match up. That would be, that's how I build things. I build things where the walls don't come together right. Okay? When God builds it, it's a chief cornerstone and it's true. It's perfect 90 degrees. Father, save us from lies. And Lord, there's all too many people out there, Lord, who say it either doesn't make a difference or that our Bible's wrong. But God, it does make a difference. And Lord, the more I studied it, the more I realized how wrong I was. It makes a difference. Father, we ask God that you save us with the incorruptible word of God. God, that you shield us. Give us a shield of perfect faith from a perfect book. Help us, to, dear God, to not fall for the lies that have been laid out there. Bless and honor your word. We thank you for it. Bless and honor your people today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.